Thank you, Mekla, for uh, the invitation to share our learnings today and also even for uh, the introduction earlier on. So what I'm going to do today is just to add some color to the uptake of low carbon construction solutions for uh, the warehousing market in Australia. We didn't follow Joe's advice to not build new and we needed to build a new uh, distribution uh, warehouse and uh, office. So we've been um, using um, low carbon concrete and uh, zero carbon concrete provided by Holcim. So um, today I'll, I'll deliver some insights on that from the point of view of the end customer. But I've also collected some feedback from um, some of our project team members. So hopefully that provides a bit of a quite comprehensive uh, view from, from our end of the market. So just a few words on Universal Store for those that don't know us. Uh, we are a specialty retailer of youth casual apparel and we have 78 physical stores across Australia and also two online stores. Uh, we have been going through quite a bit of growth uh, recently and as a result needed uh, a new facility to accommodate our operation. Uh, we probably go through uh, seven to 10 new stores per year and also our e-commerce business in FY22 has been um, increasing by 40% year on year. So as you can imagine, we need to constantly future-proof our facilities uh, for growth for the future, and in doing so, making sure that we keep uh, sustainability front of mind. And the reason why, uh, I guess, we, we captured um, some opportunities to integrate sustainability in this project is that if you look at our customer base, the 16 to um, 30 year olds, the millennials, they, they're probably quite concerned about climate change. And in terms of our team profile as well, um, it's the same thing, sustainability practices are really critically important to our team. I'm probably one of the oldest. Um, people working for Universal Store, but the rest of the team is actually quite young. Um, so most of them would be millennials that are also concerned about climate change. So um, I guess, even though we're just starting on our sustainability journey and we know there is much, much more that needs to get done, we're really enthusiastic about the path that we're on and passionate about driving positive and necessary change in everything we're doing. Um, we've got a sustainability strategy, which you can find on our website and climate action is one of the pillars that we've highlighted in our sustainability strategy. So I guess um, that permeates and filtrates through um, not just how we conduct our day-to-day -day operations and the way we select our, our products, but also through um, strategic projects like uh, the development of this new DC and warehouse. So this is going to be um, our home for the next 10 years. And therefore it was really important for us to think about um, integrating some sustainability requirements in the design and the construction of this building. Um, just making the connection with my previous career as well, I've started with Universal Store in the middle of 2021 when this project was um, already uh, quite, um, it had already been initiated. But I was bringing to Universal Store, I guess, some expertise in, um, in property and sustainable buildings. So when this project came up, that was just a perfect opportunity um, to uh, ensure um, some sustainable consideration were integrated into the design and construction. Um, some of the things that um, 
yeah, so this building is located in Eagle Farm in Queensland, right next to the Brisbane airport. So if you fly into Brisbane, you might see the warehouse. It's right next to the golf course. So just look at the window and uh, you might see the, the brand new warehouse there. So we're extremely excited. We're about to move into uh, this office and, and warehouse at the beginning of November. And um, yeah, this is going to be our home probably for the next 10 years. So it was hugely important for us that um, this distribution center, which is 5,000 square meters, was provisioned for future expansion with a mezzanine and uh, some automation possible in the warehouse as well. And in terms of the office, the 2,000 square meter office, um, it's, it was also very important to reflect to the team some of the um, requirements that they had in regards to sustainability. And we've consulted extensively through our design consultant uh, with the teams to ensure that their priorities were reflected in the project. So it's the first in Australia, I understand, um, uh, where we have been using the Ecopact Zero Carbon Neutral Concrete, not just for the slab of the building, but also for tilt panels as well. And some of the other ESD features that uh, are part of the building include renewable energy, waste and recycling infrastructure. Uh, we've also acquired and invested in electrical warehousing equipment, and there are some well-being features as well in the building, such as uh, increased access to natural light, which we didn't have in the previous um, facility we're currently um, using, and parenting facilities, because as you can imagine, in a retail business, we have a lot of um, new young mothers. So I guess the learnings uh, of the project. So as I mentioned earlier, when I joined the organization in mid-2021, the project was actually already between the concept and design phase. So there was already an approved budget for it. So when we wanted to bring our um, sustainability focus into the project, we, we really wanted to focus on energy efficiency, uh, reducing carbon emissions, waste and recycling, and well-being, as well as water um, considerations as well into the project. Um, we didn't really have a sustainability target for this project because the, the project had already been initiated. So when I came in, I thought, well, let's have um, just an ESD plan where we might want to highlight like key um, you know, focus uh, elements for the project that would um, address our needs and, and, and the, the expectations of our teams, but also match the developer um, kind of uh, capabilities in terms of delivery as well of ESD considerations. So we didn't go for Green Star um, and we decided to pursue distinct um, environmental sustainable design features for the building. So I guess the first consideration and recommendation I would make if uh, for, for people that are listening today is please ask your customer what their sustainability target is and how you can help them document it. I think it's really, really important. We were lucky with this project that I had some sort of awareness of um, uh, sustainable building frameworks, but you know, uh, most of your clients might not have any idea of uh, how to integrate sustainability. So it's important to ask the question and challenge. In terms of expertise and capacity, um, yeah, there's no time to waste. Climate change is here and it's everybody's job to build more resilient right now. So it's no longer uh, a nice to have, and there's absolute urgency to start doing it right here, right now. When I reviewed um, some of the developers' um, ESD documentation, I found out that they were quite outdated. And I think it's also extremely important for developers to take the responsibility here and to ensure that your ESD requirements are up to date and reflecting the latest innovations as well as um, you know, the, the, the new climate change and emission targets that uh, we're trying to achieve as a country now. 
So that will help your client also gain some confidence that you know um, the, the capabilities are there and, and they can rely on um, some, some of the expertise already built into your processes. With this particular project, we kind of short-circuited the traditional project structure. Um, I had conversations with Olsim directly about this particular product because I was excited to, to bring it into um, the design and, um, and make it a requirement for the project late in the piece, arguably. But uh, yeah, so I got in contact with the whole SIM uh, sustainability team and then got in contact with the national specification manager, which I then connected with the project team. This is probably a very rare occurrence. Not everybody would do that. And by the way, there are also procurement um, you know, requirements in place when uh, projects are already started, which we were very aware of. So I think um, what's important here as well is to make sure that sustainability requirements, such as the use of low carbon concrete is fully embedded in the project documentation. So that goes from the design guidelines and standards to the procurement considerations and then into the consultant scope of work as well. That's absolutely essential. Um, with this particular project, so since we could not completely, um, you know, overall um, the procurement process that, that was in place, we just tasked the project manager and the project director to consider available options. We had earmarked Allsim Ecopack Zero as one of the available options, but we told them, okay, let's go and have a look at the market again and, and see what we can do. And obviously with the location of the, the project uh, in Brisbane uh, and the stage of procurement, we needed to be mindful of due, um, due process there. And of course, um, you know, find, find the builder and the subcontractors that would be able to meet uh, our environmental ambitions within the budget that was already set. So that, that happened and uh, was pleased to, to work with, um, with TMX and, and uh, the project director from TCC there to um, really see that they were happy to take that on board and, and really help us. But we kind of challenged the typical lines of communication as well between, um, you know, that, that would normally occur between the developer and the builder and then the subcontractors that would then turn to uh, the suppliers um, of the likes of Allsim. But in a traditional project setup, I think it would have required each and every one of those stakeholders to be aware of the availability of low carbon concrete in the marketplace. So I think this is my, my fourth recommendation is to make sure that all the teams along the supply chain, um, going from the project management teams, the, direct, the project director, as well as the building um, you know, community, uh, understand that this product is available and can be procured. There was some hesitancy um, with the team around change, of course, and adopting something that hadn't been seen before in the marketplace, especially in the warehousing um, sector. So the teams, you know, that 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 worked with um, with the product were keen to to keep the risk to a minimum, of course, and keep working with the suppliers and the product that they had been working with for years and years and years successfully. So this was the first time that we we were going to use this mix for tilt panels. So there was maybe a bit of hesitancy to to adopt because there was no way they could look at the, the existing finish anywhere or get any physical references. So um, I guess they had to adapt the way they did the due diligence and focus on, on a technical, more um, theoretical review rather than being able to see and touch, uh, which um, would normally be how they go about it. Um, 
I know it's very difficult to update design guidelines because uh, I've tried to do it for government in the past, but it's necessary to make sure that um, you know the, the the documentation is is um, allowing a, a slightly different um, technical technical product to come in into a project and is, is allowed to be used. So it's really important to take the time and help um, those um, customers, like for example, government to update their design guidelines and, and allow for low carbon products to be used. Um, I'll touch on the cost because that, that was the biggest hurdle uh, for us. Of course, um, the product came at a higher cost than traditional concrete, but because that was something that we wanted to be doing for environmental reasons and, and to um, achieve our sustainability uh, ambitions to, to take climate action in everything we do, the developer and the builder work together to support us and um, were able to uh, forego some of their margin to allow us to use the product on this particular project. So um, that happened through a lot of engagement between the builder and the concreters to ensure they understood why we were doing it as a client and why we wanted to, to have this done. And even mentioned before, you know, the 8% of global emission um, being associated with concrete, that was maybe something that um, needed to be reiterated. And, um, and everybody was really very supportive to try to help us um, go towards more climate friendly solutions. So they negotiated uh, amongst uh, themselves and we were able to get the products um, from our developer and builder at cost price without them claiming margin on it. So of course that won't happen for any um, project in the future, but because that was something innovative and leading and they were keen to also, um, I guess, yeah, try and, and be innovative themselves, that was allowed for the project. So in terms of communications, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, I just want to say that um, internally, we, we had really good support from our board and from our executive team as well. We provided regular updates to the board through um, sustainability reporting to ensure they were kept up to date with how we were going. And there was also a project steering committee which was overseeing the delivery of some of the major ESD components of the project. In terms of our internal teams, we had regular newsletters, town hall meetings where we explained to the teams the details of how low carbon concrete was going to be used on the project and how it would help um, lower the environmental footprint of the office and VC project. So there was really good um, engagement at every level of the organization. We've also used this case study in our um, annual report and provided some metrics as well. Um, so all in all, we, um, yeah, we, we were really happy with um, with the fact that we've achieved this, um, this project and time will tell if the low carbon concrete performs as well over, over the long term uh, than traditional concrete. But what I can say is that from the feedback we've received, I've been told there is very little difference from a performance point of view between the uh, zero carbon concrete and conventional concrete. And um, as a customer, you know, we, we are about to take um, complete uh, full, full ownership of the building and, and there was no mention of the zero carbon concrete in the list of defects for the project. So I'm happy to say um, it's all good so far. And uh, we are in the process of uh, completing the certification process. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to see how that goes. But to wrap up 
um, I just wanted to conclude by saying, you know, project teams are definitely willing to support environmental sustainability on, um, on innovative projects when it comes to um, picking up um, some innovative construction and pro property practices. So, um, you know, let's, let's just do it. It's really an opportunity to lead for early adopters. And my learning was that with a bit of passion and conviction, it's really possible to change hearts and minds of people, you know, even if they've done this for many, many years. Um, I think the construction industry is always reinventing itself. So I'd, I'd really encourage everybody to, you know, whatever your role is on the project, to ask the question, is there a more climate friendly option available? And, and use your voice to challenge others. Thank you.